Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Now, how you perform the mechanical traction, in other words, the parameters, depends in large part on what you're doing the traction for. And you can see here at the top of the picture, you've got several reasons, actually five, that you might want to perform mechanical traction. The first over here on the left is inflamed or easily irritated tissues. Now, when we say inflamed here, I want to make this perfectly clear. We're, of course, not talking about acute inflammation. So somebody just had an injury to the spine, we're going to do traction, no. Because, remember, one of the contraindications to traction is acute injury or acute inflammation. So this type of inflammation is most likely going to be subacute or more often chronic inflammation. In this case, most likely we'd be doing what's called static traction. This is basically where traction is applied and it's just held there for a predetermined duration. There's no on, off, on, off. There's no hold, relax type of cycle. It's just held there and then once the treatment's over, it's released. You could almost think of static traction as no cycle. We only get the cycle when we start doing intermittent traction. And now for the other reasons why you might want to do traction. So this one is disc protrusions. Now for disc protrusions, you can do a static type of traction, but more commonly you'll actually use what's called intermittent traction, specifically a long hole. So we'll see in a couple of slides that the cycle for intermittent traction involves a hold and then a relax a hold, and then a relax. It's like on, off. Traction, no traction. Traction, no traction. And so in long hold, that means we're going to have a long hold before we actually get to the relaxation. And so that's more commonly what you would see for disc protrusions. Then we have soft tissue stretch. Soft tissue being things like muscles, ligaments, tendons. Remember that if somebody has a contracture in one of those types of structures, we want to apply a low load, long duration stretch. That means we're not going to apply much force to it, but we're going to hold it for a long period of time. That's your low load, long duration. And so it makes sense that if we're trying to stretch a soft tissue, we're going to apply a long hold and it's going to be intermittent. Okay. And then we get to decreased muscle spasm and joint related issues. These are also going to be intermittent traction, but they're going to be a short hold. Okay, and we'll take a look at these more in detail on the next few slides. Now this is really just an introduction to these indications because all we've done here is consider the cycle. We need some good parameters, right? We also need to consider the force that we're using to apply the traction and the duration of the treatment among other things. And particularly with the force, this is really gonna be a function of which part of the body we're doing the traction on. And so we're gonna break this up into cervical traction and lumbar traction. Let's first take a look at cervical mechanical traction. So here's a nice table right here that goes over the various parameters for different indications. Okay? So first, if we have an injury to the cervical spine and it's more in the initial or acute phase, and remember that it would have to be uh, after 72 hours post-inflammation before applying traction. In that case, we're going to use the lowest amount of force because it is a very new injury. You would use anywhere between 7 to 9 pounds of force. And you'll notice in this case that we're not actually using intermittent traction. This is a static hold, and the duration is going to be the shortest as expected, so anywhere between 5 and 10 minutes. Remember, we talked about this. So if we have that acute, a really subacute type of injury, it's going to be a static hold. Okay. Then we have joint distraction. For this, we can either apply 20 to 39 pounds of force or 7% of the individual's body weight. And this is gonna be the first one here where we're gonna use an intermittent uh, type of traction cycle. So we've got hold and relax. So these are in seconds. So the initial hold or traction is gonna be for 15 seconds. And then we're gonna relax that traction off for 15 seconds. And for this, the duration is gonna be between 20 and 30 minutes. For decreasing muscle spasm, remember this is an intermittent short hold. So we're going to expect the hold to be very short, right? And it is. So for decreasing muscle spasm, we would use anywhere between 10 and 15 pounds of force. And then the hold and the relax are both going to be five seconds. So five seconds on, five seconds off, and the treatment duration will be 20 to 30 minutes. And then for disc protrusions and stretching soft tissue, remember this would be more of a long hold. We talked about that, disc protrusions and soft tissue stretches. And so for this, we're going to apply anywhere between 10 and 15 pounds of force, 
yes, the hold is longer. We're going to hold for 60 seconds, and then we're going to relax it for 20 seconds. Okay? And the total duration will be about 20 to 30 minutes. Now, in terms of the setup for cervical mechanical traction, the best position is in supine, and you can see the person right here. Now, it's hard to tell in this picture, but really when you're doing traction on the cervical spine, the person's neck needs to be about 20 to 30 degrees in cervical flexion, so basically bent forward. And this is because in that position of flexion, it open packs the cervical spine a little bit, and so when it's open packed, it's able to maximize joint separation when you apply the traction. This gives you the best results. So you don't do it in neutral, you want about 20 to 30 degrees of cervical flexion. And really, cervical mechanical traction is only done in supine. When we get to lumbar spine, we'll see that you can do it in supine or prone. Now again, we're gonna have three rules here, and we're gonna see some similar ones for lumbar spine also. So the first rule is that the initial sessions when you're doing this traction on a patient need to be shorter. You can always start off lower and then go higher, but you don't want to start off high. You always want to start off on the lower end of the duration. Okay? And for all of the applications, regardless of whether it's this initial phase or these others, we want to start off at about seven to nine pounds of force. And we can certainly increase it from there. But again, this is this thing, we don't want to start off too high. We can always start off low and then increase it. And in general, you do not want to exceed 30 pounds of cervical traction. Okay. Now you can see here that for joint distraction, you can get up to 39. But again, remember, we're starting out at seven to nine pounds. And then for this, we'd increase up to 20 per patient tolerance, right? And then in the next few sessions, if the patient can continue to tolerate it, or maybe they're just a really big person and their body weight's really high, and 7% of it goes up to 39 pounds. But again, in general, especially for these other ones, we are never going to exceed 30 pounds, okay? So what's the clinical evidence for this? Well, it's moderate evidence for cervical traction. So let's just read this. Clinicians should consider the use of mechanical intermittent cervical traction combined with other interventions such as manual therapy and strengthening exercises for reducing pain and disability in patients with neck pain and neck-related arm pain. So this neck-related arm pain, this would be more of a radicular type of pain. So you have compression of some kind of nerve root in the neck, and it leads to pain in the arm because the cervical nerves actually go down to the arm, right? Or it could just be neck pain. But the key here is we're not just using mechanical traction as a standalone treatment. We want to also do manual therapy and or strengthening exercises for the neck and possibly upper extremity. Okay? And there's moderate evidence for that use. What are the adverse effects of this? They're going to be very similar to what we'll see in the lumbar spine. Excessive force may increase symptoms. This is why we always want to start out with low duration and low force. And we can build those up per patient tolerance and response. There can also be a rebound increase in pain. Again, this is why we start low and increase gradually with each traction session. And there can also be discomfort from these belts. Here's one of those belts right here, especially if they have jaw problems. Um, and there can be other issues as well. But again, there can be discomfort from the belts. Or maybe the patient has trouble tolerating the particular position that they're required to be in for this. The other thing that you want to watch out for is whenever you release the traction at the end of the treatment, the patient should not just get up immediately. Okay. Uh, this can actually make them dizzy if they move too fast after it. So you want to make sure that the patient lays there just for a minute or two, sometimes even more, and wait till they're not dizzy, and then slowly sit up and sit at the edge, and then just wait a minute, and then they can stand up. So this is not something where you finish the treatment and they just pop right up. That could cause some orthostatic hypotension and lead to falls. So you want to make sure that after the treatment's over, you just gradually get them up to sitting and then gradually get them up back to standing. Okay? So that is mechanical cervical traction. Let's now look at mechanical traction of the lumbar spine. And what you should notice here is that the cycles are very similar, the durations are also similar, but the poundage is what's greater. Okay, And if you think about it, it makes sense. The lumbar spine is stronger, it's bigger, and it's sturdier than the cervical spine. And so that means that not only the lumbar spine is able to tolerate more, but you're going to have to use more force to get the same response that you would have had in the cervical spine from before. 
okay? So here's the same indications. We've got the initial really subacute because it has to be 72 hours after that acute inflammation, okay? But for this, we're gonna use anywhere between 20 and 44 pounds of force. This is again where we're not gonna have an actual cycle. It's gonna be static traction, and the duration will be five to 10 minutes. Now for joint distraction, this is where we're gonna use 50 pounds of force, and we're gonna hold that traction for 15 seconds and then relax for 15 seconds, 15 and 15, with a treatment duration of 20 to 30 minutes. And then to decrease muscle spasm, this will be in terms of the person's body weight, either a quarter of their body weight or 25% of their body weight, that'll be the amount of force used. And then for hold and relax, it's gonna be five seconds on, five seconds off. Five seconds traction, five seconds no traction for 20 to 30 minutes total. And then again, for this disc protrusions and soft tissue stretching, kind of like that low load, long duration stretching, right? We're also gonna do this in terms of percent body weight. So again, 25% of the individual's body weight. And then the hold is gonna be for 60 seconds since we want that long duration. Then we're gonna relax for 20 seconds for a total of 20 to 30 minutes. Again, we have these rules down here. Remember, our initial sessions need to be shorter in length. We wanna assess the patient's response. We can always increase the duration in later sessions if they can tolerate it well. For all these applications here, we wanna start at 30 to 45 pounds of force with the exception of this first one. We probably wanna start out a little bit less there and then build up if it's needed, okay? But for these others, so joint distraction, muscle spasm, disc protrusions and soft tissue, it's sufficient to start around 30 to 45 and we can also build it up from there. In general, we don't wanna exceed 50% of the person's body weight of force for lumbar traction. So you can see the joint distraction is the highest amount of force, whether it's cervical or lumbar spine, but we're not gonna exceed that 50% of body weight, okay? Now, there's two positions that you can do lumbar traction in. The first one over here is prone. The prone position is the best position to reduce disc lesions. You can also do that in supine, uh, but the best position is in prone. The reason you may have to do it in supine is not all patients are going to be able to tolerate the prone position. Uh, some geriatric patients and those with limitations in spinal extension are going to find this very uncomfortable. And so you may have to do it in supine, but the good news is you can still reduce those disc lesions in supine. It's just prone is the best position to do it. Now over here is supine. You can see this positioning is very different than what it was for the C-spine because in this case you have the person's hips flexed up and their legs are supported over this platform. In this position, when you apply the traction, this is really good to open that intervertebral foramen where the nerve roots exit because if you have uh, intervertebral or neural foramen that's too closed and it's compressing a nerve root and you open it up, that will actually relieve some of that pain and uh, potential radicular symptoms on the nerve root. So it helps open that intervertebral foramen. Also, you can get better traction on the zygopophyseal, also called facet joints. And as we mentioned, it can also be used to reduce disc lesions. Now for lumbar traction, there's a little bit less, or I should say conflicting evidence as compared to the cervical spine. Let's actually look at this. There is conflicting evidence for the efficacy of intermittent lumbar traction for patients with low back pain. There is preliminary evidence that a subgroup of patients with signs of nerve root compression along with peripheralization of symptoms or a positive cross straight leg raise test will benefit from intermittent lumbar traction in the prone position. So let's stop there for a second. So what that means is that if you suspect that a patient has some kind of radicular symptoms, that's the signs of the nerve root compression, so they've got radicular symptoms, and they have peripheralization of those symptoms, or they have a positive cross straight leg raise test, then that means that there is some evidence that traction will help those patients. And if you can, you should do it in the prone position. Now, there's also moderate evidence that clinicians should not use intermittent or static lumbar traction for reducing symptoms in patients with acute or subacute, non-radicular low back pain, or in patients with chronic low back pain. So chronic low back pain likely has other causes, um, and if it's non-radicular pain, there's not a lot of evidence that this will actually work for them. The best evidence to use mechanical traction of the lumbar spine is if they have that nerve root compression, so radicular symptoms, with peripheralization of those symptoms or a positive crossed straight leg raise test, okay? 
and the adverse reactions are very similar to what we saw in the cervical spine. Again with this, you want to make sure that when they get up after the treatment's over, you do it slowly. So slowly help them get to sitting and assess their response, make sure they're not too dizzy, and then once you, they're clear, you can get them to stand. You don't just want them to pop up. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of mechanical traction and the parameters that we would use to do the treatment. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.